aftermarket of GMBH. George Morad is the head of sales for the Middle East and Africa uh, and uh, overseas. He's responsible for regional sales strategies and overseas coordination, including the Dubai sales office. Before joining the purchasing department of the Mali Group in 2008, he worked as advanced supplier quality engineer and low cost countries sourcing coordinator for the automotive supplier Foresia in France. Please welcome Georges Morad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a topic which is very, very actual, the CO2 reduction. And what does, uh, what does that mean for, uh, for cars and for engines in terms of performance? So a very short presentation about the Mali Group. Mali is one of the 30th uh, largest automotive suppliers worldwide, the German company. We have uh, engine systems and components, filtration and engine peripherals, uh, a business unit dedicated for the aftermarket, and a business unit ded dedicated to industrial applications. So more than 100 production locations worldwide, 48,000 employees, and a turnover uh, of more than 6 billion euros. Here you can see basically our product portfolio. We always used to say everything which is in the engine and around the engine, we are producing it. And basically in 50% of the cars worldwide, more or less, you have minor components. Let's go to our topic, the CO2 reduction. Um, as you probably know, uh, we have this uh, global warming issue and in Europe and in the USA, um, the OEMs are struggling with the CO2 re reduction regulations. Uh, the regulations are being um, more and more strict and uh, OEMs and Tier 1 suppliers have to work to see how they can reduce uh, the emission level to reach uh, the, um, the future uh, regulations. If you, if you look at the regulations in 2004, we had uh, levels that were permitted uh, between 135 or 150 till 260 uh, gram CO2 per uh, kilometer. And if you look to 2020, the regulations will allow a level which will be between 98 and 138. So, and it is really uh, uh, a drastic reduction. So, and um, in terms of having fun, this has, this has of course uh, uh, an impact on the engines because if you want to reduce CO2 reduction uh, emissions, the first thing you do is you reduce the size of the engine, the power and everything, so it means less BHPs, less fun by driving. And this is something, of course, which we don't want to see. So that's why uh, the automotive industry has been working on uh, different technologies in order to be able to uh, fulfill the requirements, the regulations, and also to keep the level of performance we're having uh, with the engines or even to increase the performance of the engines. So many, uh, there are many ways to do that, so hybrid vehicles, downsizing, so these are the two topics I will present you a little bit more in detail. Then you have many other uh, technologies, I'm sure you all uh, heard about these technologies, star-stop, energy, energy recovering systems, uh, friction reduction, weight optimizing, and uh, many kinds of new components and new technologies. Here you have uh, some example of um, components and technologies like lightweight valves. So these are valves that are extremely light in, compar in comparison to the normal valve, but they can uh, sustain the same stresses, the same load. Uh, pistons, usually pistons are made by aluminum casting. So uh, we started with heavy duty. We, the automotive industry started with steel pistons, forged pistons for the heavy duty uh, trucks. And now the steel pistons are also coming for passenger cars. And you have different kind of uh, camshafts, for example, camshaft technologies in order to reduce the weight of the components because every single gram you can uh, save in the weight of the components has a direct impact on the CO2 uh, emission of your car. So as I told you, we will focus on two uh, technologies today. First of all, the hybridization and the electrification. Here you have an overview about the different kind of drive, uh, drive-train systems that are available. Here you have a normal car with a conventional, uh, conventional uh, combustion engine. So this is the car that I'm sure almost all of us here are driving. Then you have the hybrid vehicle. The most popular uh, example of hybrid vehicle is the Toyota Prius because they were the first to come with this technology in the market. This is basically nothing else than a, a car with a normal combustion engine and with a battery which is acting as a support to the engine. Then you have uh, the downsizing. Downsizing is a key technology for the future because uh, downsizing is very simple. You try to have the same power, the same performance, 
uh, than a normal engine, a six cylinder for example, but only with three cylinders. So we will see later how this is possible. Then you have the range extender. So the range extender is, let's say, similar to the hybrid vehicle, but in the other way around. The main drive or the main, uh, the main uh, drive system is the battery. And you have a combustion engine which is acting as a support to the battery. We will also see later what is it. And then you have the 100% electrical vehicles. I think worldwide we have five or six applications today. There is a lot of noise about this uh, electrical cars, but uh, it will take some time before to come. And finally, you have the fuel cell vehicle. Uh, in the automotive industry, we have been talking about the fuel cell technology for more than 20, 25 years. And until now, it's uh, nothing happens. It's a very, very promising technology, but very complicated technology. Hybridization. Here you have an example of a car, so it's a small car, which is having a range extender. So from the outside you don't see anything. If you look at the main data you also don't notice uh, something, something special. The acceleration from 0 to 100 km in 12 seconds, this is let's say a standard. Uh, the maximum speed of 145, this is something that we limited, but normally the maximum speed can also go to 190, 200 km per hour, no problem. And if you look, the interesting thing is the CO2 emission. It's less than 45 grams per kilometer. And this is really a big, big, big performance. So how can we reach this? It is very simple. You use a range extender. What is, what is a range extender? A range extender is nothing else than a normal combustion engine, a small engine, usually two-cylinder engine. Many uh, players in the automotive industry are working on this kind of technology today. And you put the range extender in an electric car. So basically here you see, you can put it here, and here you have the main battery, which is driving the car, and the range extender is only uh, acting as a support to the battery. And the difference with the Toyota Prius, for example, in the Toyota Prius you have a direct connection from the engine to the wheels. Here, the engine is not connected to the wheels at all. So he is not driving the car, he's just acting as a support to reload the battery or to give the, 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 the power in some special conditions. So, and uh, if you look, the nice thing, it, it's very small. It has uh, the size of a, um, a cabin hand luggage, so you can put it basically everywhere in the car. And it's very, very uh, flexible for the automotive, uh, for the OEMs, because, you know, space is playing a big role today in the cars. And now if, you, if we go to the performance, so we have here uh, a graph with, with, which will show the advantage or, or the performance of a range extender. The NEDC is a new European drive cycle. This is a drive cycle that has been developed by uh, the authorities uh, in order to make the tests and to have some official figures about CO2 emissions. Then we have another commuter cycle. This is the normal cycle, urban trip. Basically, uh, you go make shopping in the city, so you have short distances, uh, you start and stop the engine and so on. So this is basically what uh, all of us are doing during the weekend or during the day to, to, to get shopping and so on. And then the, you have the business use with several short and long distance trips with an average distance of 610 kilometers per week and average speed which is a little bit higher than the commuter cycle, about 62 kilometers. So this is basically, you go in the morning to work, you come in the evening to, to home and then you have also a business trip, so you have a longer uh, distance to drive. So this is to explain you the cycles. If you look here at a normal combustion engine, a 1.6 liter four cylinder engine, very common engine. And if you look at the CO2 emissions uh, for the three different cycles, you are between, in the best case, okay, in this business use case, more than 150. And in the normal case, or in the, in the commuter cycle, which is the worst for the, in terms of emissions and, and cons uh, fuel consumption, almost at 175. So this is a normal car with a normal engine. Now you take a car with a, com uh, with a range extender. So a battery as a main drive system, and the range extender as support to the battery. In uh, the new European drive cycle, you reduce the CO2 emissions by 82% to a level that of almost 30 uh, gram per kilometer. If you take the best case, so the best case in that case is you wake up in the morning, you go in your car, the battery is fully loaded, you don't have to use the range extender at all, you can drive to work only using the battery. Same thing in the evening, so no emissions at all. It's a clean vehicle. And in the other, the business use, so also a normal kind of use, reduce the emissions up to almost 70 grams. So you see, you, are, you have such a space, uh, if you look at the regulations of 135 uh, grams per kilometer, this is really an amazing technology. 
Now you take the range extender, worst case. So it is, your battery is not uh, completely loaded or it's completely depleted. So you drive the car, the range extender has to, be, uh, has to be activated immediately. And even in that case, you reduce uh, the emissions up to 140 grams more or less, so you are closer to the regulation. In the best case, you can reach 75, 77 grams per kilometer. And in the worst case, you are at 125. So again, even in this kind of uh, configuration, you can uh, fulfill the requirements. The downsizing, what is the downsizing? As I told you, the downsizing, this is nothing else than a, a, a normal engine, which is smaller. So here you have a demonstrator engine just to show the performance of a downsizing engine. Basically, this engine is a three cylinder, having the same performance than a, a six cylinder, a 2.4 liter six cylinders. So how can you achieve this? The main component in a downsizing engine is the turbocharger. Because with the turbocharger, you can really have the same performance than a bigger engine, but you have a better combustion. Better combustion means less CO2 emissions. You have a smaller engine with lighter components, so a better weight. And all these things are helping to reduce the CO2 emissions and to keep the same performance or even better performance than a normal engine. And this is really the technology for the future. And in Europe, if you look at the trend, many new cars are coming with smaller engines. If you take a normal uh, Audi A6 or BMW uh, 5 Series or big limousines, usually everyone wanted to have a six cylinder, okay? Today, most of, the, most of the sold are with a four cylinder and some of them are also coming with a three cylinders with one or two turbochargers. So this is a very uh, important and very interesting technology for the future, which is already available in the new cars and the OEMs and the, uh, and the tier one suppliers are still working to optimize all the components and all the combustion in order to take the maximum uh, profit of this technology. And here you can see some figures. Uh, we have been putting this engine in a, in a car, the car you just saw before, the Volkswagen Passat, and we have been driving a normal uh, new European drive cycle and to see what would be the, the, the advantage. And we have a reduction of CO2 emissions of more than 30% and a fuel consumption of 32%. And we are, we are having exactly the same performance, even better than a six cylinder with 2.4 liter. And in terms of uh, having fun with driving, such an engine is much better because you have the turbocharger, so you have a completely different feeling and it's much more reactive, much more dyna dynamic. So this shows you that actually um, you can fulfill the new requirements, the new regulations, and you can keep the, the fun factor by driving. And that's why we, we think uh, that actually the combustion engine still has decades and decades and decades. Because today, this is really uh, the most advanced technology. There is still a lot to develop in order to increase the performance, to reduce the emissions. And that's why uh, hybrid vehicles or 100% electrical vehicles are coming slowly, of course. But before that they get uh, a real market share, it will, it will last uh, 10, maybe 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, George. Well, what we're hearing here is a reduction in CO2, a reduction in fuel consumption, and we're still going to go fast. We're still going to have fun. Thank you, George. I might, I might now take, because these two topics are a little bit separated, I might just see if there's any questions in the room now for George based on this presentation. Any questions before we move on to the next presentation? We all want one. We, yeah, yeah, we all want one. Thank you very much, George, for coming over for your presentation today. Thank you so much. Now, we've covered tyres, we've covered fuel and lubricants, we've covered parts. But now let there be light. Let there be light. All the way from Arizona in the United States, our next presenter has, has come. And there's a couple of interesting notes in, in the, the handout that you have, which I'll just point out to you. Michael DeHaas, who is president and CEO of KC Highlights Incorporated, is married to Michelle, which is fantastic. Hi, Michelle. Great to have you here. They have four beautiful daughters. I've only got two. But they are identical, well, they're all identical twins. No, two, two sets of identical twins. And this puts them in the Guinness Book of Records. How amazing is that? But also one other amazing fact, born on the same day, the 18th of March. 
what are the odds of that happening? No, let's not work it out. But that's fantastic. So here we go. They live in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is very close to the Grand Canyon. Michael is a graduate of North Ari Northern Arizona University, where he received his bachelor's degree in marketing. He's also a graduate of the University of Phoenix, where he received his PhD. No, he didn't receive his MBA. Next time, PhD. KC Highlights has always been a family business which was started in his family in 1970, but he purchased the business in 2004. So please welcome Michael and his wife Michelle, who's joined with, who's with him here today, to, his, to hear about lighting basics, types and technology. We would all be in the dark if we didn't have lighting. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, today we're going to talk about lighting at its very basic level. Um, how do I get this to change? So lighting at its very basic level, there's two types on all vehicles, two types of lights. There are lights to see with, there are lights to be seen with. The general rule of thumb is a light that is colored red or amber is a light to be seen with. Headlights, clear lights are lights to see with. So examples of lights to be seen with are tail lights, your turn signals, your brake lights, your hazard lights. Lights to see with are your headlights, your interior dome lights, etc. Then when we get into different types of lighting, there are fog lights, there's driving lights, there's spotlights, there's floodlights. And what's the difference between all those? This is a very basic pattern that will show you that the, the fog light gives you a lot of left to right lighting, be it either amber or clear fog light. The driving light reaches out past your standard high beam headlights, and then the spot beams go much further than that. The way light behaves, light behaves much like if any of you have squirt water out of a hose and if you squirt it real tight you get a lot of distance and then as you start spreading that out you lose your distance but you're getting more breadth to your to your lighting light light behaves much like that water out of a hose very very similar in in fog lights and driving lights the the way you achieve the optics can either be through your lens or through your reflector. So this amber light on the end is a fog light that we made 30 years ago. It has vertical fluting. Vertical, when light passes through vertical fluting, it gives you a horizontal beam pattern. Technology has changed to where we can now control that light with a reflector. So this is a new fog light. This is a 30 year difference between these two lights. So we're using reflector optics in this one in my left hand and using LED lights as the light source. This light, we're using a halogen bulb for the light source and we're using lens optics for that light. So lighting has evolved, started off with incandescent lighting, then moved to halogen lighting, which was a breakthrough at the time. Halogen, halogen lighting burns very hot, but it was, it was a much wider light than um, 
incandescent lights. Then it progressed to HID and then LED. And on this, this stand, I've got, I've got examples of each. So we have a halogen light here, we have an HID light here, and we have an LED light here. The future in lighting is LED lighting. Many things you can do with LED lighting. Oh, here's, here's some examples of what lighting would look like on a wall, a spotlight, driving light, fog light. Fog lights, I'll get back to that. Things you can do with LED lighting that you can't do with halogen lighting. This is a fog light. We can run it clear or amber out of the same light. So you can flip a switch and your lights go amber. You can flip it the other way and your lights go clear. So there's some advantages to LED lighting. Where to do that with halogen, you need four different lights. Now you can do it with two. But there is a cost to that. LED lighting is much more expensive than halogen lighting. So technology does cost. Then we get into color temperatures of light. Color temperature is measured in degrees Kelvin. So natural sunlight is about 5,500 degrees Kelvin. As you start going up higher in color temperature, Light has a wavelength to it. So the higher you go in color temperature, like you can see the violet, the blue, the green, those have a shorter wavelength to them than the red and orange and yellow. So an example of that would be, if you've ever seen a police vehicle way down the road, you will see his red lights before you will see his blue lights. And that's simply because of the wavelength of the light. It's not that the red's brighter than the blue, but red light has a further wavelength, so it travels further. So people that are putting these 6,000K and 9,000K headlight bulbs in their vehicles, as you start getting up to 9,000, when you look at it, it's very offensive, but when you drive behind it, you can't see as far. You can't see as well. So really good color temperature is right around 5,000 K. Our LEDs, we run anywhere from 5,000 to 6,000 degrees Kelvin on our LEDs. We feel that that gives us the, the, the optimum color for seeing. So here's the, here's the uh, it talks about seal beams, which is incandescent. So those are the old headlight bulbs, you know, and you see those next to a halogen, they look very yellow, and then you look at a yellow, or you look at a halogen headlight compared to an HID headlight, and the halogen looks very yellow. And, and you know, an LED, I mean, you can, go, you can go as high as you want on degrees Kelvin, but the higher you go, the worse it is for C. So again, LED's the future. They, they save energy, you know, there's no radiation, they're instant on, unlike uh, HID, sometimes has a warm-up time. So that's the basics of lighting. Wow. Excellent. So, blue lights travel for, no, they don't travel as no, far as... No, blue does not travel as far. No. Let me wow. get oh, my presentation's wow. off. So how about that? Red light travels further than blue light. Yeah. So what we're moving to is green lights. How far? Is it? No, I won't go there. I won't go there. No, no. So see how far green lights travel. Kevin's come all the way from uh, Arizona. Is your first time in the UAE in Dubai? No, I was here last year. Oh, yeah, last year as well. Great, great yeah. to you come back again yeah. the second time. Please visit Kelvin on his stand. Have you got a stand at the, in the exhibition center? Side three. Side three. Okay. Please go and check him out in the limited time we have available. Please join. Any questions though? I'm sure that. Yeah, here we go. I'm going to provide you with. Sarah's going to give you a microphone to help us. Uh, this product is uh, now available in Dubai? 
Is which, which available? Our line? The lights? Yes. Yes. They're it's available. available. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's me. You have an agent here? We have four agents here. Four agents. Yes. We have um, Fancy Auto. We have Icon. We have AEV. And we have Remy 4x4. Okay. Is there any innovation in the future from the light? Yes. We're working on stuff beyond LED lighting. But I can't talk about it. Wow. Okay, thank you. Next year. But come back next year. But LED and, is and, the future. Well, and, and the, oh. the key to LED. <clears throat> you'll see a lot of LED lights mounted to big bars, and they're all mounted to aluminum pieces. LED gets very unstable once you get over 100 degrees Celsius. So these are basically just heat sinks for the lights, so it's to dissipate heat. The LED itself doesn't get hot, but the boards to drive it get hot. Okay, uh, also the material is plastic? No, it's it's aluminum. aluminum. Or or you can do magnesium, which is even better, but it's more expensive. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do, you have, do you have an agent in Nigeria? I don't know, I'm not you the should. international guy. <laughs> we should connect you to Are, are you in Africa at all? Uh, we are in Africa. We do a lot in South Africa, Namibia, uh, Zimbabwe, um, down in the southern part. That's the southern part of Yes, it. yes. And now Nigeria. In Nigeria is West Central Africa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll get you a business card of our, our wow. international guy. Okay, yeah. that would be great. Yeah, but we have, we have a big presence down south. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the common misconception about lightning is something you just laid out here now, which is people tend to go for the higher Kelvin, right. thinking it's but the thing is, when you when you look at it, it's very offensive to the eyes. That's correct. It really gets to you, but it doesn't really see much down that, the road. That's I, correct. I've been through that. And yeah, kind of, yeah. Okay. But yeah, it looks very offensive. But when you're driving behind it, you it can't see, see as that. far. It and see they that. can be the same wattage, same optics, mm -hmm. and the light won't travel as far. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions before we wrap up? Please join me in thanking Michael for his presentation this morning. And Shedding light on the subject for us. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to all of you who have been here for Auto Mechanica, 2000, Auto Mechanica Academy 2013. I look forward to seeing you here next year. Each year we bring you as much as we can in terms of information. One of the delegates who was here yesterday actually said, people should come here to Academy before they walk the floor. This is where the information is and we're here to give it to you as much as we can. That's why we bring the experts in year after year. So safe travels, great to see you here and inshallah we'll see you again next year.